Have you ever tried arm wrestling your dad or any middle-aged man just to be absolutely demolished by what can only be described as superhuman strength? Well, me too. This phenomenon is often referred to as old man strength. I wanted to understand the scientific reasons as to why old man strength occurs, but many of the articles I read didn't give a sufficient answer. So I took the research into my own hands. I soon realized that many labor-intensive jobs like construction, farming, landscaping, and so on are relatively similar to weight training. The only difference is the movements that are performed. I looked into multiple factors that contribute to developing and determining muscle size and strength adjacent to resistance training in hopes of trying to identify why the heck are old men so strong and to see if there's something we can do in order to attain this strength for ourselves. And before we get started, I'd like to mention that while this video is backed by scientific studies, a lot of it is just theory and I'm just trying to connect the dots to get a solid answer. One of the biggest reasons old man strength is so fascinating is because they don't need to have enormous muscles to perform incredible feats of strength, and this is where muscle density comes into play, which essentially refers to how much of your muscle is actually muscle. Things like intramuscular fat and sarcoplasm are present within the muscle, but myofibrils and sarcomeres are most responsible for muscle contraction and strength. Losing intramuscular fat is the simplest way to start getting denser muscles. One study found that having higher levels of intramuscular fat may be related to less force generation in skeletal muscles, but this was mainly present in the obese and elderly. Losing intramuscular fat can be done through exercise or just general weight loss. However, this alone will not directly increase strength for the majority of people. So let's look at something a little bit more complex. There's a widespread belief that muscle size is akin to muscle strength, but this is far from the truth. A great example of this can be seen in rock climbers and F1 drivers, surprisingly. These are athletes who need to have immense amounts of strength while staying at the lowest body weight possible. To achieve this strength without gaining much size is through myofibril hypertrophy, which is essentially when the number of myofibrils within the muscle increases. Myofibrils are made up of protein filaments like actin and myosin, which slide past each other to generate force, causing muscle movement and contraction. The best way to achieve myofibril hypertrophy is through high load, low rep training. For example, a set of bench presses would be performed at 80% of your one rep max for between four to six repetitions, done for around three to five sets, with adequate rest intervals. This style of training is very common among powerlifters who usually train compound movements to improve explosive power all around. By working in these higher load, lower rep ranges, you must generate greater force and intensity to complete a movement. While implementing progressive overload, your body will grow and thicken your muscles' contractile proteins, in turn making you stronger. On the contrary, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy increases the amount of sarcoplasm within the muscles. Sarcoplasm fluid is an energy resource that surrounds the myofibrils, and if you have more sarcoplasm, you'll have bigger muscles. To give a visual representation, imagine this circle is your muscle, and the little balls are myofibrils, and all the open space is sarcoplasm. Through sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, you will gain more sarcoplasm and increase the size of your muscle, but not substantially change the number of myofibrils. To give an example of this for myofibril hypertrophy, the number of myofibrils will increase, without substantially affecting the size. This is known as myofibril packing, where your muscle has a large number of myofibrils, but not much sarcoplasm. Unfortunately, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a bit of a controversial topic, or rather understudied. There are studies that support it, but also studies that refute it. This is because the two hypertrophy types usually happen in conjunction with one another. It's often said that bodybuilding style training will have the greatest effect on sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, so being in a rep range of about 12 to 15 reps with moderate weights or pump training is optimal for muscle size. This is not to say you won't gain muscle strength or achieve myofibril hypertrophy, but the extent to which you do so will supposedly be less than what a training plan that's more powerlifting focused would accomplish. Looking deeper into the training methods in relation to old man strength, there was a very common myth I encountered when I began lifting, which was training in higher rep ranges around 20 or more with low weight will tone muscles rather than substantially build size and strength. However, many studies I looked at suggest that this misconception is untrue. The most important part is that you're training until near failure or failure 
and your results will practically be the same as what a conventional lifting program would do. This brings us back to the main topic of the video, old man strength. We can see a complete range of rep ranges within their everyday work. For example, if you're a construction worker who uses sledgehammers or any type of tool that weighs 5 pounds or more for an entire day, you would most likely begin to fatigue your muscles to a certain extent. It may seem insignificant at first, but over the course of years, those movements add up hugely resulting in both myofibril hypertrophy and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. In contrast, if you are a farmer, you will most likely deal with a complete variety of movements, but focusing on explosive actions like lifting, stacking, or throwing hay bales would greatly build strength as the necessary force exertion will be increased to complete those tasks. Additionally, carrying bags of animal feed that weigh over 40 pounds would greatly develop a foundational strength throughout your body, which will improve your overall strength. While these common labor jobs may not look like training, they definitely are. Tendon strength also plays an enormous role when building this hidden power as tendons alone can significantly increase force output. Tendons store elastic energy inside of them during activities, which is then transformed into force and movement. They return about 90 to 97% of the energy they are given, which is then used to drive joint motion. Strengthening tendons or stiffening them will basically make their elastic capacity much greater. For example, if you have a resistance band that's pretty thin, you'll feel elastic tension, but it won't give back a lot of energy. If you have thicker resistance bands, however, they will store much more elastic energy and give back a lot more force in comparison to the thinner resistance bands. And the same principle applies to tendons. And they can be strengthened through a few methods. The first training methods are isometrics and slow eccentrics. This is essentially where you take a heavy weight and hold it in one position or do a slow negative with it. This will increase the tendon's thickness, which will result in greater energy capacity. When tendons are in a stretched position, microdamage occurs in the tissue, which the body then repairs. Much like when muscles repair themselves, tendons grow bigger and stronger to become resilient to future stressors. Isometrics that can be seen in labor jobs are variations of the weighted carry and also possibly shoveling as the arm is in an extended position without constantly contracting the bicep. Other training methods like plyometrics have mixed opinions for tendon strengthening because putting tendons under very high stress suddenly can cause strain if not done cautiously. However, that is not to say that all explosive movements are bad for strengthening tendons. Sprinting, for example, utilizes a lot of the tendon's ability to return force rather than the calf's ability to contract. If you look at a cheetah, for example, they have a long, thick tendon rather than a big calf muscle. Resistance training is a much slower way to strengthen tendons, but there can still be massive benefits. When you recite a movement over and over again, more blood will accumulate in that muscle region, and it will actually induce collagen synthesis. As well, through resistance training, the organization and alignment of collagen fibers improves, which allows the tendon to distribute the tensile load more evenly throughout the fibers. This is beginning to make a lot more sense now because labor workers are essentially doing chronic resistance training, which will not only improve blood flow to their muscle areas, which will increase collagen synthesis, but they're also improving that alignment and organization of collagen fibers. One thing to note is that tendons take much much longer to strengthen than muscles. You can begin noticing changes within muscles in as short as eight days, but tendons, however, take up to two months. And this is because the blood flow to muscles is much greater than tendons. Tendon training should be done gradually and cautiously. For example, yes, having stiffer tendons will increase force exertion, but it will also decrease flexibility. So when you are thinking of how you're gonna train your tendons, it should be catered to your needs. Now let's talk about muscle memory. There is a concept that is a little bit controversial, understudied, and not completely understood. So we'll approach it with a grain of salt. It's called nucleus overload, which is where the number of myonuclei within the muscle increases. But what even are myonuclei? They are essentially the brain of the muscle fibers, which work to regulate gene expression and protein synthesis. More simply, they are heavily responsible for muscle growth. When you work out, more myonuclei are acquired to support the synthesis of new proteins and the growth of muscle tissues. But here's where it gets crazy. Myonuclei are supposedly not lost on D-training, 
So say you trained a lot in your youth and then you go train again maybe 5 or 10 years later, you will apparently have a much easier time regaining that muscle. Unfortunately, one of the only studies I found that supports this used mice rather than humans, and that's why it's a little bit of a controversial topic. But the overall concept of muscle memory is generally accepted. It may not be too smart to generalize mice to humans, but for the sake of the video, we will. To increase the number of myonuclei within the muscles, all you have to do is train. And the more myonuclei you have, the more effective you'll be at building muscle and adapting to future stressors. So for example, if you were working a very fatiguing labor job, the number of myonuclei would increase and you'd build muscle much more efficiently, which would make you stronger. However, muscle memory goes beyond myonuclei because as you get older, you actually get better at moving. Maybe not flexibility wise, but let me explain. There are two fiber types within the muscles, slow twitch and fast twitch and each of them play a unique role when engaging in physical activity. Slow twitch muscle fibers are more resistant to fatigue and are better for endurance activities, whereas fast twitch muscle fibers are heavily responsible for explosive movements but are less fatigue resistant. For example, an ultra marathon runner would want more slow twitch muscle fibers and a sprinter would want the opposite fast twitch. This connects to old man strength because as you age, you move utilizing your muscles, which improves the neural pathways between your mind and your muscles. By reciting a specific movement, the neural pathways become much stronger, allowing for more effective muscle contraction and control. Your brain will learn which fiber type is best for a specific movement and optimize recruitment patterns to those muscles. All of these improvements are the result of just training and movement, known as muscle plasticity, which is essentially the muscle's ability to become more effective at adapting to future stressors. Some changes that occur are increases in the muscle fiber size, changes in the muscle fiber type, stronger neural pathways for fiber recruitment, and better metabolic capacity within the muscles. But our main focus is gonna be on those neural pathways. For your body to actually move, your brain needs to send signals to your muscles in order to contract. And this is known as motor unit recruitment. To achieve greater movements, your brain recruits more motor units in order to overcome or attempt to overcome a stressor. Although we can't actually use 100% of our muscles, usually when completing daily tasks or working out, we use the minimum amount of motor units necessary. But what if we could change that? By increasing training intensity with progressive overload, motor unit recruitment will increase over time. But we can also try something called overcoming isometrics. This is a fairly simple concept. All you have to do is load up a bench press, a squat, or a deadlift, pretty much any workout with way more weight than you're, you're capable of moving. Then all you're gonna try to do is move it. Give it literally everything you have for about three to eight seconds, and you'll notice that it doesn't move. Big surprise, I know. What you're doing though is asking your brain to give you more strength because clearly your muscles just aren't doing the trick. Your body will try to generate more force, in turn recruiting more motor units and utilizing more of your muscle fibers. The Bioneer has some awesome videos on overcoming isometrics. You should definitely go check them out. One day, maybe I'll make some of my own. Now, let's get back to old man strength. If you're a newbie lifter, you're just not gonna be able to recruit as many motor units as someone who's been training or working for decades or years longer than you. Adults who have spent large portions of their lives doing unconventional training methods are gonna be far more competent at recruiting motor units and utilizing their muscles to the highest degree possible. This is because of neuromuscular adaptation, which is where your body becomes more efficient at recruiting motor units in response to stressors. And once again, it is developed through training and moving. But aside from all that boring scientific stuff I just went over, the question still remains, can you gain this strength? Is there some magical training method you can add to your regime to give you old man strength? Well, sadly, probably not, but feel free to prove me wrong. The training methods and exercises mentioned earlier are a great place to start, especially if you want more hidden power. But the truth is, Old guys just have a huge advantage against us. Peak muscle strength and density is usually achieved in your late 20s to early 30s, and it only slowly decreases for the next few decades, only by about 3 to 
which isn't very significant. Then when you hit your 60s, muscle mass and strength start decreasing much faster. Also, this strength that older men have is somewhat involuntary and it kind of just comes alongside with the lives they live. Some men might not even have it. But remember, this is just a theory. And maybe it really is just a superpower that the burden of fatherhood brings you. And maybe mom strength exists as well. For now, just keep training and thanks for watching.